All right, welcome to CS uh, 4510. Um, the topic, this is the last video on computability theory. Next week we start complexity theory. Uh, very sad. L14B, Kolmogorov, complexity, Kolmogorov, complexity. We could talk about computability theory for like three courses of material, but at some point I have to make a compromise with myself and decide how much I actually like computability and how much I like complexity, and we have to cover complexity in equal amounts. Um, Kol Kolmogorov complexity, you guys have heard the co name Kolmogorov perhaps in one other context. Do you remember what it is? Probability theory. Probability theory. Kolmogorov's axioms for probability theory. Is that it? I think so. Yeah, the only, <laughs> that's probably the only thing he knows, he's known for. Kolmogorov complexity is a fascinating topic in the theory of computation. Um, uh, essentially, so Kolmogorov as a person, also fascinating character. Guy was Russian. Also, like Alan Turing, he was gay. But there was like a movie where he was like, he lived in a one-bedroom apartment on the river with another mathematician. So obviously, you know, that's how it, I mean, they're gay. And then Stalin tried to blackmail them to kill, I don't remember, they try to blackmail him to get him to rat on his advisor or something. I don't. It's an interesting story. Um, all these guys have movies made about them. It's always, it's always kind of interesting stuff. Anyway, Kolmogorov complexity is everything in this class is you have some immaterial concept like computation is formalized with the concept of uh, a Turing machine. Thought, the rules of thought, the application of thought is formalized in the concept of logical axioms. Everything in some sense is. You have this immaterial floating idea, and it's been formalized in some sense. You have a feeling, and, it, and you create a formal model of that concept. The Kolmogorov complexity is itself a formalization of one of uh, such an immaterial idea, but it's of the notion of the randomness with respect to a finite object. So, unlike a random variable, it's it's you have a fixed object that looks random. So, consider the two strings. I hope those are the same length. I'm not going to count. Um, certainly, you have a vibes-based intuition, like that one looks more random than the other one. right? If you had to explain why, why would you explain to someone why this one appears more random than the other one? Like a, like a, like a, like the number of ones should be equal to the number of zeros in expectation. I see. So you're starting. So if you have an idea of a random string, you have. If you you're actually going the opposite way, which is the probability probability theorist way. Given a random variable of some biased probability, perhaps this is what its outputs should look like. We're doing the other way though. Given a fixed object whose existence is described and determined what conditions enumerate that object. What we really mean here is, what is how would you describe a string to someone were you to tell someone about it? Right? You describe the string to someone, perhaps you could do it in a shorter way than this one. Right? So by what we mean by a sense of algorithmic randomness is, is it easy to describe? Is it hard to describe? And generalize this notion not for like short strings like this, but like billion length strings or something. Okay, is this piece of information easy to communicate or not? That's sort of what Kolmogorov complexity tries to uh, do. It it attempts to what's uh, define what's called a measure. Now Kolmogorov complexity is not actually a measure on a very technical basis, but it kind of is. A measure is a function from things uh, to Either the real numbers, the positive real numbers, or the naturals, such that you have like uh, if you say mu of x is equal to zero, then you know that that's true if and only if x has nothing, whatever the thing is being measured. And then if you say, for example, mu of x is greater than mu of y, you can intuitively say that uh, x has more of it. Uh, then why? Give me some examples of measures that exist in any mathematical context. Area. 
area. What are some others? I'll give you some hints. Area is certainly a measure. Anything dimensional, uh, abstract from a dimension. Length and volume. Those are also measures. An object of zero area has nothing, right? Um, what are some other measures we can think of? Absolute value. Absolute value of what? Of a number. Of a number is, it, is a measure. In an abstract sense, OK. The naturals are themselves a measure on the naturals. The identity function is a measure of how far you are from the zero, OK? Uh, what are some more like physical intuitive measures? I'll give you another one. Probability of an event occurring is a measure because the probability of an event being zero means the event is, has no measure. It's measureless, right? Um, what are some other ones? Randomness, how random a string looks with entropy. Uh, many things in physics are known to be measures. Uh, joules, you know, uh, entropy. There's all kinds of things that end up being measures. So we wanted to find a measure on strings. And we want it to be like a cardinality of sets as a measure. That's another one. That's a big one. We want to create a, a, a kind of a measure on finite strings to tell us like something like a measure. How algorithmically random is it? Like how hard is it to describe this? And the history of Kolmogorov complexity is that several people came up with the same definition at the same time. But Kolmogorov did it the best. So we call it Kolmogorov complexity in honor. Other people did it. Kind of OK. Smir uh, Solmano Solomonoff did it for one specific application, which was great, but he didn't develop a general theory. Chaitin did it as like his bachelor's thesis project or something. Everyone discovered it within a few years of each other. And there's some fable. It's like, you know, when the theory around it is developed enough, like, you know, the way flowers bloom, everyone's going to discover the same thing at the same time. So, but Kolmogorov gave the best treatment of it. Basically, we're going to describe a function, k of x, from strings to uh, the natural numbers that hopes that we measure it. Uh, like, if k of x is big, we hope it to mean that this string looks random. You know? In fact, if you flip a coin, these two strings have equal probability of occurring. These two specific strings have equal probability of occurring. But this one appears, so a probability theorist could not distinguish between these two strings. But yet, this one we know appears more random to us. right? It looks random. It turns out that the theory of computation gives a very accurate Description of how to comp uh, uh, of what the Kolmogorov complexity is. It's simply the length of the shortest program that takes no input and prints x. So we'll define k of x to be min p in the set of all programs, such that uh, we're minimizing over the length of p, such that we take a universal simulator, we give the program to the universal simulator with no input, and it outputs x. So this is. Lots of words, but let's break down the, the, what this says. Minimiz minimizing the length of the, the smallest program over the set of all programs. Pi is a set of all programs. P is a program. Find the smallest such program such that whatever universal simulator you have, perhaps it's a universal Turing machine, give the program and the empty string to this machine. If that machine prints x, uh, that's the smallest such program. right? Now, why did I say? Uh, Programs and not Turing machines. It turns out it's invariant to the choice of mo computational model. Um, there's also no real big difference between a machine returning a string or a machine printing a string, right? There are many, many little intricacies with programming languages that don't really matter in the theory of computation. Compiled versus interpreted is another. You know, all these really don't. Anonymous function naming, whatever. These don't really matter. Um, and k of x is independent of language choice. But we'll prove today this is a very rigorous and actually very strong definition. It's very powerful. It's such a simple, elegant thing. There's a book by two authors called uh, Lee and Vitanyi. The Lee Vitanyi book is like, it's, it's called Introduction to Kolmogorov Complexity. But it's really like the Bible. And they have 900 pages just on the properties of this function. Okay, they outlined in the in the beginning of the book three syllabi for three courses you could teach on the function. You could teach three courses on the function. We don't have that time. We're going to do an hour on the on the function, and hopefully it'll give you a taste of how interesting this function is because it's just one simple thing. It's, that's it. Any questions on just the definition of the function before we get into proving some things about it? Yeah. 
Yes. Oh, wow. Okay, yeah. I mean, I guess this is just back to what you're saying about languages not mattering. If, like, the return is longer than the string. Or we'll prove it in, in two seconds. We'll prove, we'll prove what's something called the invariance theorem. The choice of language doesn't matter. And then ask me that again. Question. Is the definition of pi, is it just? The set of all programs of some fixed programming language. Okay. In fact, you consider pi the union of all possible programming languages that's installed on a system. All of them choose the, choose the language and the program. Yeah. Um, so why am I saying program? Why am I not saying Turing machine? I've been saying Turing machine for everything. Why did I decide to stop saying program? It doesn't matter. The choice of program is independent. The, the, the complexity, the Kolmogorov complexity is independent of the choice of program. Um, let's prove it doesn't matter. Consider two specific languages, uh, two specific uh, definitions of Kolmogorov complexity on two specific languages. The two languages that I can think of that are the most different are Python and Rust. Okay. Consider two language specific measures. K of pi of x is the shortest program, the shortest Python program to print x. K rust of x is the shortest Python program, shortest rust program to print x. Okay? We'll prove the invariance theorem that these are no more than a constant apart. And then therefore the choice of language doesn't matter. As we continue with the proof, observe where Python is actually important or where Rust is actually important. You see it doesn't matter. Any two languages. Um, so, in fact, uh, both Python and Rust are presumably Turing complete. That means you could write the compiler for one language and the other, and you can write the interpreter for one language and the other. I call there's no difference between them. So let's suppose someone set out to write a, a Rust interpreter, excuse me, a Python interpreter in Rust and a Rust interpreter in Python. What would such a thing, why would someone do that? Um, well, certainly a Rust a Python interpreter in Rust is more useful than a Rust interpreter in Python, but certainly it's in, possible in theory. Consider the following program. f of n, a function called interpret. This is a Rust program. If you don't know Rust, that's OK. Uh, it takes as input a string of Python code, and it interprets it. So it's the inter this is the Python interpreter. That's like the billion gigabyte whatever it comes with the standard library, all those little things. Suppose I just put those into one big function, and I put that in a Rust program. Okay. Uh, then consider that I have my main function that does the following. Let pyprog uh, be a string, which is uh, a Python program. So let's see if I'm using Unix. User bin Python 3. Uh, I don't know if they still do that. Slash n def f slash n slash t, right? Something like this. Convert the Python program to a really long string, okay? Um, and then we're going to interpret the Python program. Okay? Now, for, any Kolm, for the Kolmogorov complexity of any string, you can always find an upper bound on the Kolmogorov complexity by simply giving a program to print the string. You haven't proved that there is no smaller one, so you can't prove it's equal to, but you can have certainly shown that no, none of the bigger ones are, are worth it, the time. right? So we know here this is a Rust program to print x, right? Consider some whatever string this prints. This is a Rust program to print x, but as a function of the smallest Python program to print x. Do you agree? Let this Python specific Python program be the smallest Python program to print the string x. So we may upper bound the size of the Rust program by the size of the Python program plus, a, plus the size of the interpreter, which we'll call a program pi of pi in Rust. As a function of x, what is the size of this? How big is the Python interpreter where you write it in Rust? Constant. Constant size. Now, the Linux, you know, a C compiler is constant size in the size of the input you give it. Dijkstra's algorithm is constant size, but it runs on graphs of a trillion nodes. A compiler takes its input code. The compiler is fixed in the size of the input. You know, the compiler is only a few hundred megs or whatever, and the Linux kernel or Mozilla Firefox, whatever, it's like a billion, jillion gigabytes. 
So the interpreter is constant size in the size of the input of the code that's given to it. So this is just some constant. So we see that Rust, the smallest, we haven't proven there's no smaller program, but the size of the Rust, the size of the Python program plus a constant is an upper bound to the size of the Rust program. Now, you can actually just repeat this argument and write a Rust compiler in Python. That would be far less useful and would not get you on the front page of Hacker News or anything, but you could do it in theory, right? Would you, why would you do that? I don't know, but it's possible. Because both Python and Rust are Turing complete. So in fact, we get a relationship that's mirrored, that the smallest Python program has to be less than or equal to that Rust program, plus the Rust compiler. Now if A, if you know that A plus, if you have two numbers such that A is less than or equal to uh, B plus O of 1, and b is less than or equal to a plus o of 1, then you know that the distance between a and b is less than o of 1, some constant, right? So in fact, we know for these two specific language-specific measures that the, the, Kolmogorov, the Python Kolmogorov complexity of string x minus the, Kolmogorov, the, Py, the Rust Kolmogorov complexity of a string x is bounded by some constant. So if we change the language, we don't change anything about the asymptotics of the Kolmogorov complexity. We simply change this constant, whatever it is. No, they differ by, at most, a fixed constant, no matter what the constant is. And also notice that Python and Rust weren't really specific here. As long as one language has the ability to interpret or compile the other, in which all Turing complete languages do, this is true. Right? So in fact, we'll define for like programming languages L1, L2, we define the Kolmogorov complexity to be then the less than or equal to the min of all possible language choices, k l1 x, k l2 x, right? And so on. Each program just continue, contain the entire standard library of that language or whatever as a constant. So this is called the invariance theorem, and it's why we say program. We may drop the Python and Rust subscript, and we'll just talk about k of x from here on out. Questions on this proof? Do we believe it? Any, any doubts? Language, I mean, I mean, if you think about it, languages don't really speed anything up algorithmically. Church Turing thesis is a big hammer in this area. It's a big, uh, every, makes everything look like a nail. You, when you choose to implement something in a language, you don't ever say, well, it's impossible to do this in this language. Let's do this language. You always make that decision based off available standard libraries or whatever framework or whatever you're using. Really not esoteric quality to the language, right? Security is a feature of Rust, things like this. OK, now let's actually just compute the Kolmogorov complexity of some strings. Uh, we can only upper bound them for now. What is the Kolmogorov complexity of every string x? Give me an upper bound on any string. Print x. Print x. F takes no ints. Put, it has x hard coded. Print x. That's a program to print x. What's the size of this program? Like, like size of x plus a constant. So we know we can upper bound the Kolmogorov complexity of string x. Uh, by the, the length of x plus some constant c. And we'll write plus c. It's an it's a unknown plus c similar to um, a plus c in calculus when you take the integral. It is independent of x, but specific to the language. In Python, c would be the length of this print statement and some other things, right? Um, what about the Kolmogorov complexity of the string xx, where is x concatenated with itself twice? Uh, well, let's do a bad way first. Let's do def bad. Takes no input. X, x takes on print xx. What's the upper bound for this specific program? Size of x, x plus c. Yeah, so 2x, we'll say, plus c. But I claim there's a shorter program to print this. Give me a shorter program to print xx. Something like that. 
x concatenated with x. What's the size of this program? It's plus c prime, we'll call it. Now, I'm only going to do this once. I'm writing c prime here instead of c. That's only because it's a different constant. But know that in the future, it doesn't really matter. c prime is a constant bigger than c. Notice the big difference here. This is a program that simply hard codes x, and then it prints it. This is a program that says, I don't need to hard code all of x. x excuse me. I only need to know x. And then from the information of x, I can compute xx. So xx is a long string, but the information content of xx is not that much more than the information content of x. So in some sense, x and xx have very similar complexity, even though one is twice as long as the other. Right? And also, there's the trade-off between computing and uh, storing. Everything is either stored or computed from. Give me an upper bound on the Kolmogorov complexity of, N of x concatenated with itself n times. Describe a program to me that prints this string. This is x, 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 x concatenated with itself n times. Again, takes no input. x equals itself for i in n print x. Now, I should say x concatenate yourself before printing because the print function does a new line, right? I don't care. It doesn't matter. You can, returning and computing, you could fix, returning, there's no, like, theoretical difference between a program returning something and a program printing something. In, in this class, especially, you understand those to be the same. So, what's the, what's the size of this program? As a function of the input, xn, not the input, but the, size, the function of the string being printed, what's the size of this program? x plus n plus c. The size of x, but what's the size of n? I don't know. Well, you do know n is a number. What is the number of bits it takes to write down n? Log n. Log n. This is a convention we'll use. If it's a string, we'll write the size of x. If it's a number, we'll write log of x. Know that if x was a number, then the size of x is just log of x. Right? This much, much shorter, though, than the size of x to the n right? plus c. So in fact, this is a compressed way to write x to the n. But it's not the only way. In fact, you can, comp you can actually give a shorter program for uh, x to the n, right? You hard-coded x here, but who says there's not a shorter program to print x? So let the, com the complexity of x equal some program g. So instead, you'll do this, def f x takes on g. Now, g is a program that does not hard-code x. Maybe it does in the worst case, but G is a program which computes X. And we'll do the same. We'll say H. This size is going to be what? This, the the Kolmogorov complexity of K of N is going to be less than or equal to the Kolmogorov complexity of X, the shortest program to print X, plus the shortest program to print N, plus a constant, right? Is that less than that? Yeah, probably. It's at least the same. It's, it, 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 it's at least not worse. We can only say that. Right? Any questions on that? OK, one final one. I'll just do it here. What is the Kolmogorov complexity of a string x reversed? The reversal of string x. It's the same as x. Or yeah. Why? Because you can take the same program, but then when you print it, you print it backwards. So I guess it's plus a constant. Backwards. In fact, uh, the constant would be the reverse code. Yeah. But it's constant. So in fact, we can say that this is that the search program to 
if you have a short program to print x, you have a short program to print the reversal of x. Run the program to print x and then reverse it. So these are not so far apart. And in fact, again, let's do the explanatory power. That kind of corresponds to our notion of what this function should be. A string and its reversal should look as random as each other. It's not like when you see it, it looks random and then you reverse it. Suddenly, you know, you're playing peekaboo and it doesn't look random anymore. The concept of looking random is invariant to reversing it. That sounds true. Questions on that part? So which strings have short descriptions? Which ones are the ones that are random and which ones that are not random? We may say a string is compressible if its description is very short. And we may say a string is incompressible if its description is very long. But what's the longest description a string can have is itself, right? A string is compressible if the shortest way to explain the string to someone is just to say the string. A string is compressible if you, there's a shorter way somehow. So we want to know how many strings are compressible, which strings are compressible, how to compute which strings are compressible, and so on, right? So let's actually do a ratio first. Um, let's fix n, and let's consider the strings of length n that are compressible by two bits. Right? So consider the strings of length n. Uh, fix n. Want to know uh, strings of length n compressible by two bits. Two bits is nothing. Suppose you have n is a trillion, OK? We're looking for the number of files that are n bits long that when you zip them, you run the zip file algorithm or whatever, you get a file that's two bits less or nothing. And again, two is really small in the context of n. Let's say that we're considering all files of one gigabyte. There's more, more files of, a, of actually a megabyte than there are stars in the universe, seconds that have ever passed, you know, things like this. Um, so we're going to compute this as a ratio. On the top, we're going to have strings compressible by two bits. And on the bottom, we're going to have just strings of length n. Let's just compute this ratio and try to find an upper bound on it. Um, the strings of length n is the size of sigma to the n, right? Those are all the strings of length n. Uh, if a string is compressible by, by two wits, then it's, a, it's an element of sigma to the n. It's an n-bit string compressible by two bits such that the Kolmogorov complexity of x is less than or equal to the length of x minus 2, ish. I'll say ish, because of course there's constants involved in this. But let's say the shortest description of the machine, it, you can explain it with two bits less information. And that's again for, a, a, consider n as a trillion billion, right? Um, but Every uh, string that is compressible by two bits has a program of a certain length that prints x. So instead of considering the strings that are compressible, consider the programs of a certain length. Now, not every program prints a string, but we can upper bound this by considering all the programs of a certain length. So we'll consider instead the set, uh, the set of programs such that the length of the program is less than or equal to n minus 2. Do we agree? That's a huge upper bound, in fact. That's a great upper bound, because most of those programs probably don't print strings. Most of them do who knows what. But we can certainly, every string that has a program to, that, of a certain length there is, is mapped into this, injectively into the set of all programs, right? Um, but what is every program? Every program is just a string. So let's upper bound this even more again by the number of strings of up to length n minus 2. So we're going to union i is equal to 0 to n minus 2 of sigma i over sigma n. Yes? Yeah, absolutely. Let's just fix 0, 1. Uh, 
All right. We have a... These are disjoint sets. We have a union. Anyone remember the name of this? What we're about to do? Union bound. This is going to be sum of i equals 0 to n minus 2. What's the cardinality of 2 to the i? Sigma to the i. Let's call it 2 to the i for simplicity. Uh, what's the number of strings of length n? 2 to the n. Do we agree with that math so far? Um, what is the sum of powers of 2? Anyone remember the formula for that? 2 to the power of any sum minus 1. I think this is 2 to the n minus 1 minus 1. Double check me on that. And then the bottom is 2 to the n. But this is less than 1 half. Let's take a moment to think about what we just did. We tried to derive a formula as a function of n of the number of strings compressible of length n by two bits. And we have a function that is independent of n. So what this says is less than half of all the strings of length n can be compressed by two bits. Consider all the files that are one gigabyte and you run them all through the zip file algorithm, only half of them are going to get smaller. Let's suppose we wanted to shave off not two bits, but a byte. Let's rederive this as a function of compressing a string by k bits instead of compressing a string by two bits. Where are we going to get our, um, our d? Let's suppose we compress by k bits. We're going to get 1 over 2 to the k minus 1. So if you want to compress a file by 11 bits, there's only like 1 in... A thousand files can be compressed by 11 bits, right? Let's say you want to compress a, a file in half. You want to compress a gigabyte file into half a gigabyte file. None of the files are going to work, right? So what this says is, in fact, most strings are incompressible. For most n, for most... Uh, for, not for all, but for most, k of x is greater than the length of x minus a constant. Most strings, in a truly uniform random sense, if you generate me a random string with probability extremely small, will it ever compress? Right? There's two things we can, we can say here. This kind of makes sense. Uh, a random string should not be compressible. Um, there's also like a, a very simple pigeonhole argument you can make about. So I'm, I'm, I'm conflating the fact of like the zip file algorithm with Kolmogorov complexity. But what I mean when I say that is like consider all possible compression algorithms. In fact, they don't work is what we've sort of proved here for any possible way you could organize that in a, in a data structures way. Um, you can prove that by a pigeonhole argument, right? Consider all strings that you want to, if you consider a function, from uh, strings of length n, which there's 2 to the n of them, to strings of length less than n. How many strings of length less than n are there? There's 2 to the n minus 1 of them, right? If you consider f to be the zip file algorithm, such that f of x is equal to x dot zip, and that given x dot zip, you can go backwards so such a function is injective, some file is not compressed by the pigeonhole principle. So certainly, an incompressible string must exist. But in fact, most strings are incompressible. If you generate a uniformly random image, it's going to look like TV static. right? So why does file compression work in practice? Is the reason is because the, the information that humans deal with all the time is not random at all. If you consider you try to compress a JPEG of a parrot, it's going to have large splotches of red on it, large pieces of information. If you compress a text file, it's going to have repetitive sentences. Words are repeated all the time. You know, If you generate a random ASCII string, it's going to not, it's, there's no chance it looks like human English. The, the objects that humans deal with mathematically are very non-random. Even consider the examples that we've done so far. Consider the string of length n of un, that's unary. Consider the string of length, length 1 to the n. What's the probability you generate this string? This string is very compressible. A description of this string is only its length. What's the probability you randomly generate this string? If 
you, if, I, if you have a random number generator, it generates strings of length n. What's the probability your string of length n is all ones? Yeah, 1 over 2 to the n. And if n is 100, this is le you have less odds than the universe exploding or whatever, right? Never happens. This generalizes for all examples. Consider all the strings that we've talked about that have short descriptions. What is the probability that you generate a string xx? What is the chance that you generate the string xx? Basically negligible. Such a random string can never occur. The first bits are whatever, then the next ones must be determined, right? It's like 1 over 2 to the n over 2 or something, right? Um, what is the probability you randomly generate a string of x to the n? Even worse, right? So the strings that are uh, compressible are, in some sense, lucky. They are the pieces of information that uh, have short explanations and short descriptions. But we can see that most strings are incompressible in a random sense. This doesn't really apply too much to file compression, I would say, because it does work in practice. But in theory, Lempel ziv and the zip file algorithm work on no inputs, right? You'd be hard pressed to find, well, you'd be randomly hard pressed to find an input that it does work on. But in practice, you could just take your files in your desktop and it would work perfectly. Questions on that? Yes? Can we know if a string is incompressible? Great question. Let's get to that later. Let's talk some more. Pro well, I promise we'll answer that question, but we need to follow my choreography. So we'll get to we'll get to that in a moment. Um, more questions? We see an interplay here already with the theory of computation and randomness. These are the first links, and probably part of why this function is so fascinating. Just a small part of why this function is so fascinating. Let me plot the function for you. We can kind of infer what a plot of this function looks like uh, by some properties that the function has. So let's plot the function. Um, it has four properties, that at least probably more. But let's consider, again, the Kolmogorov complexity takes strings to numbers. Let's suppose those numbers were just, those strings were casted to numbers. Let's compress those. So consider it as a natural valued function. It has four properties. One, uh, k of x hugs log of x. Most strings are incompressible. So we know most of the time it's near log of x. It will never go above because we proved that every the shortest program to print a string is less than k of x. But it's near it. Most of the strings cannot be compressed. Two, k of x dips infinitely often. Why is this true? k of x is equal to k of 2x, which is equal to k of x squared. And by equals here, I mean like plus or minus a constant, right? And we can't really use big O here, but like asymptotically with additive constants. This is also kind of like k of 2 to the x, which is kind of like k of uh, square root of x plus x, right? If you have a computable function, uh, the size of a computable function is constant. So the shortest description of x is just equal to the size of the x applied when you apply a computable function to it, right? But notice that x, 2x, 3x, x squared dip infinitely often, right? 3, k of x grows unbounded. So we know that it's growing forward, perhaps not monotonically so, but it's going up. Why is that true? Longer strings of higher complexity. That should be believable. Strings of length 1 million should have a larger complexity than strings of length 3. Question? All right. 4, k of x is kind of continuous. Right? Do you recall a definition of continuity in uh, like your calculus class? It was like what? It was like f of x plus h minus f of x over h. Is that it? Anyone remember this? You take the limit of this. Essentially, you have some curve, OK? And then you're like, 
If you, if you incur a small change in x, then only a small change happens in y. Something like this, right? A small change in x means a small change happens in f of x. Kolmogorov complexity can't be defined continuously because it's a discretely valued function, but it looks continuous in the sense that it's not totally random looking. The, Kolmo, the distance between uh, k of x and k of x plus or minus 1 is less than some constant, right? k of 2 is close to k of 3 is close to k of 4. K of 1 million is close to K of 1 million and 1. Kind of similar valued. This is in contrast, if this was not a property of this function, it might, the function may look like this. If you ever try to plot a hash function, that's something that comes out of it. It's not very polite. Um, given that, we can kind of sketch the function. So here's the log of x, right? So let's draw, let's draw K of x to hug log of x, dip infinitely often, and grow unbounded. Perfect timing. There's our function k of x. That's what it kind of looks like. Um, questions on that? It has some nice, interesting properties of functions. We know a lot about the function. But surprisingly, why am I saying we can't actually, like, why didn't I just plot, give you an actual plot of it? Why did I, like, guesstimate a plot of it? Why did I describe these natural function properties instead of proving them? Um, it's because k of x is not computable. There is no algorithm that computes k of x. That was the, that's what we'll prove next. There is no way to determine then if a string is incompressible. It's improve, unprovable. So although this is kind of interesting, we have a naturally valued function, which we can plot with high estimation, because we have all these nice properties of the function, yet the function itself is incomputable. It cannot be sufficiently estimated from above and below simultaneously. Otherwise, it would be computable. All kinds of interesting things about this. Like, you, you, we know its property is a number value function, but we, it's, provably undecidable, as in like there is no Turing machine that which halts on all inputs to compute the Kolmogorov complexity of a string. That perhaps should be guessable because it's a meta question. It's, about, it's a program asking about the lengths of other programs, but still kind of curious that, that that's the case. Any questions on that so far? Yes? Can you approximate it? Um, K of x can be approximated from above, but because it can be approximated from above, it cannot simultaneously be approximated from below, because then those would converge to the function, and therefore it would be computable. But you can approximate it from above. Uh, consider strings of length n, try them all, see if they compile, run the program until they print the string or don't print the string. Right? If you, if, if you found a program that prints a string, you know that it's, you only have to look at the programs less than it. Some of them will probably loop, but try to run them all simultaneously in a dovetail fashion. Right. So maybe we would call it recognizable, but we're not talking about set here. We can say it can be approximated from above, is what, would, what we would say. Wait, how does that not compute it if you just check every single program? Most of the programs uh, will loop. And you don't know if they will actually provably are stuck in a loop or they just haven't printed the string yet. That's practically what happens. All right, well, what we're going to do is, in fact, you can use the recursion theorem to prove that Kolmogorov complexity is algorithmically unsolvable, or you can do, you actually don't need it. We'll do it both ways. We'll do it one, without, uh, one with it and one without it. Uh, can assume to the contrary that the Kolmogorov complexity of strings x is computable. Consider. Uh, this machine M, M on input, uh, no input, it's going to uh, choose some C that I'll describe later, and then it's going to do for uh, X, we'll say M on input W, for X in uh, sigma star uh, lexicographically, So this means empty string 0, 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, and so on, alphabetically increasing. Uh, if the length of x uh, is greater than c, print x. And halt. Excuse me, not the length of x. So sorry, so, so sorry. 
if the complexity of x is greater than this constant c, print uh, x and halt. Okay. Then uh, go back and choose c such that uh, c is much much greater than the length of x, the length of m plus log c. Right. So when you take a program, you compute the length of the program, and then you paste the length of the program in there. You're going to change the length of the program. So what you do is you just choose an even bigger number, so that you, the number, the amount that c is, must be greater than the amount that you change the program length to. Okay. So c is some number which is bigger than the length of the program m. Okay. Um, uh, since uh, k of x, we know k of x is greater than uh, c, right? Because m prints c, m prints the f m, m prints the first lexicographic string, which is whose complexity is greater than this constant c, right? Uh, but we know that the length of c is then greater than this this m, right? Because c is chosen to be bigger than m. But m prints c, excuse me, m prints x. So we know that the complexity of x is upper bounded by this short program to print x. That is a contradiction. We have, on one hand, that the complexity of x must be larger than this program m, but also that the complexity of x must be less than or equal to the length of m. Contradiction. What's the name of this proof technique? This is, this is a diagonalization. There's no table set up. What was the self-reference that occurred here? The self-reference that occurs here is we encode a program with a number bigger than its length. The negated self-reference occurs because we print a string who, which is longer than my length. So this is why it's important to not Restrict yourself to diagonalization in a tabular way. Now, of course, this can be redone, obviously, with the recursion theorem. Uh, m on input w. Uh, obtain, via the recursion theorem, a copy of my own code. Uh, for w, uh, we'll say x in sigma star lexicographically. Uh, if the complexity of x is greater than the length of m, print x. Same thing, right? But it was actually not needed for the recursion. The recursion theorem is not fully needed here because you're allowed to overestimate your length. But you could prove it with the recursion theorem just the same. So we see that k of x is, although it has all these fascinating, interesting properties about randomness, it itself is not computable. That, I think, is an insane fact. In fact, that you could write 900 pages of a textbook on a function which, at the, at the core, cannot be computed. That is, I think, a crazy thing to me. Any questions on this proof? Very similar to the proof of MinTM, right? OK, let me give you an application of Kolmogorov complexity. Uh, there's something called the method of incompressibility. The method of incompressibility is a proof technique which, once you learn it, uh, you will hold, you'll probably hold on to it forever because it makes many proofs short. The method of incompressibility is kind of like the pigeonhole principle or like, uh, have you guys heard of the probabilistic method? Probabilistic method, in some sense, shows because uh, you can show the existence of an object by showing that if that object was chosen randomly, its probability of being chosen is greater than zero. So it must exist. In some sense, Kolmogorov complexity is like an average, excuse me, the method of incompressibility is like an average case uh, version of that. What you're going to do is assume to the contrary something, uh, show that implies something else must be too compressible, and that's a contradiction. There are infinitely many primes. Who, do you guys remember who proved this first? What's his name? Wait. You 
you forgot? Which Greek? I was a whale. Huh? What, what was your guess? Let's hear it. Spinoza. Um, I wanted, I wanted to say Terrence Tao. Definitely not. Definitely, Ter 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 Terrence Tao did recently, as in our probably in our lifetimes, prove the Tau Green theorem, which is that the sequence of primes must contain arbitrary long arithmetic progressions, but we're simpler than that. Terence Tau, we're, I wouldn't prove that in class. I don't have time. We're, pro <laughs> we're proving, the, not the Tau Green theorem, we're proving uh, there are infinitely many primes. The first guy to do this was Euclid, right? You want to say Euclid? You can get credit. You oh, me. No, no, no. I'm not from 2300 BC. Um, three, excuse me, 300 BC. There are infinitely many primes. This is a classic fact. What you do is you say, assume there's a tantra, there's finitely many primes, consider n is equal to p1 times pk plus 1. None of the primes divide it, and yet it cannot, so, but it's also not one of the primes. So therefore, contradiction is not infinitely many primes. We can actually prove using Kolmogorov complexity that there are infinitely many, that there are infinitely many primes. Assume to the contrary, there are finitely many primes. So for all n, n can be written as a product of primes to powers. p1 e1 times p2 e2 times dot 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 times pk ek. OK? For k primes, let's suppose k. There's only finite, let's say there's k primes, OK? K is maybe a million, whatever, who cares? Assume to the contrary, K, there's finally many of them, right? But notice that E1 through EK are then a short description of N. Consider the program that takes no input, def F. Uh, E1 takes on, EK takes on, we're going to say brute force compute P1 to pk. Now the primes do not need to be stored by the program because you have an algorithm that can determine primality always. Brute force search is one, but there are other primality algorithms, right? All such algorithms are constant size, so you don't need to store it. Just say I'm going to brute force search for the programs again, okay? Then we're going to return n, which is equal to p1 to the e1 times dot, 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 pk to ek. So this is a program which takes no input and prints n. What's the size of this program? We see that the Kolmogorov complexity of n must be less than or equal to what? Guesstimate the size of this program for me. Interesting thing about Kolmogorov complexity, it's, not, it's nothing like the analysis of algorithms because you're allowed to do expensive brute force search things. You're not counting iterations of a for loop. You're counting how long the for loop is to describe. The description of this machine is simply these hard-coded things and then this constant size thing, right? So what is that? What is the size of this function? Log of E1 to log of EK. Plus log of p1 to log of pk. Well, actually, I constructed it in such a way so I don't have to store p1 to pk. I simply would have to store, I don't even have to store k, but I, 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 can, I can brute force search for the primes again. Oh, is one prime? No. Is two prime? Yes. Is three prime? Yes. Is four prime? No. Is five prime? Yes. So I found the first three primes, right? Sorry. And I simply use the number of variables I had stored as the number of primes to look for, right? Important for our compression is the fact that I didn't have to store the primes, OK? Um, how big is each EI? So each EI, right, so n is equal to like p1, e1, right? So like n is like less than pi e to the i, right? So in the worst case, we know that EI is like less than log of n. We know EI is upper bounded by log of n, right? Is that to believe you? If EI is a prime is a po power prime of n, we know that it's less than log of n. Because n log of n has to be n is so much bigger and it's raised to the power, so less than log of n. So in fact, we also know that log of EI 
is less than log log of n. You agree? Let's take the log of both sides. So we'll simply upper bound this by log of ei. We can each upper bound each one by log log of n. That's equal to k log log of n. Do you guys see the contradiction here? Well, I'll say it in, there's one sentence that's remained unsaid, but I want to see if we can get it. What is the contradiction? We said that for all n, the short description of n is the number of primes times log log n. But we proved via the incompressibility arguments that but for most n, k of n has to be greater than log of n minus c. So choose an incompressible string, contradiction. Just say, you can just say let n, but let n be incompressible. We know this to be true, contradicting this for large enough n. This implies, essentially, if there were finitely many primes, we could have a short description of every single number. But we know most numbers don't have such short descriptions. Every number is, can be encoded in log log n bits. Not true, because most numbers take log n bits to compress. Even compressed, you can't do better than log n. That's the contradiction for this. Questions on this one? Kind of uh, not the first way I think you would try to prove there are infinitely many primes. This is the classic problem of thousands of proofs. And this is one of my favorites because it develops a very interesting theory and this application that pops out of nowhere. Right? Questions on this proof? Any step misbelieved, unbelieved, unsure of? I'll do one more uh, such proof. It's going to be a problem we've already done in this class. None of you are going to guess what this one is. Uh, a to the n, b to the n is not regular. We can do this, we can prove this language is not regular in a faster argument than we can with the pumping lemma. Assume to the contrary, uh, L is regular, not with pumping length P, but just regular. Then there exists a DFA D for, for L. Run D on a string A to the N. It will stop at state QI. Okay? Run the DFA on, on A to the N. You stop at a state QI. What do you know about this DFA? If you resume execution from state QI, only seeing Bs, the first except state that you reach must be exactly after NB transitions. You will not reach a, an except state following only the B transitions any sooner. Because otherwise that would accept A to the N, B to the N minus 20 or something, right? So here's a short program that uh, encodes a number N, too small. Uh, def f, uh, we have the description of a DFA here. We have q takes on this state qi, and qi is computed beforehand, before encoding, hard coding it into this program by running d on a to the n. Um, we'll say counter is equal to zero, uh, while true. Uh, if Q is an element 
of the final states uh, print C and halt. Uh, else Q is going to take on delta B Q. So we're, we're at state Q. We're applying the transition function following transition B to some new state. Maybe we self-loop. Who knows? Um, but we repeatedly apply the transition function to, to B. Repeatedly apply the transition function following B transitions. And, and then we'll stop uh, when we're done. And then, of course, counter C plus equal, plus equal 1. Okay? So we're going to print some counter. This is a hard-coded program that prints some number n. Okay? But that n is determined by whatever we piped into n and computed qi beforehand. The size of this program is what? We have a complexity k of n. This is a program that prints some number n. What is the size of this program in terms of its components? States, transition function. We'll just call that size of D plus the size of QI plus some constant. What is the size of D in terms of N? It has to be at least N. It's actually, N could be a trillion. The DFA could have three states. What is the size of a DFA in terms of the input of the DFA? This is a trick question, but constant. Constant. The DFA is a fixed size. The input is however big the input is. Don't you need a certain amount of states to accept a to n, b to n? Uh, we're proving, assume to the contrary, that such a DFA exists. Yeah. Certainly, you do need a certain amount of states by the pumping lemma. But you always need more and more states. But uh, assume to the contrary, there's some DFA of fixed number of states. It's constant size. What this says is that the complexity of n for all n is just a constant. That's wrong. Contradiction. Not all numbers are constant sized. a to the n, b to the n is not regular. This relied on a, a few things. First off, the description of the machine is always finite. It's constant. Great. The description of the instantaneous computation of the machine in terms of a DFA is also constant. That's not true for a Turing machine or a PDA or things like this, because a, con a, a configuration of a PDA is the stack, which may not be constant size. Configuration of the PDA of a Turing machine is also the tape, which may not be constant size. Plus some constant, but here we get the constant. You can rederive this for certain context-free languages as well with a very difficult encoding scheme. But here we were able to prove easier, in my opinion, than the pumping lemma, that there is no uh, DFA for a program for a to the n, b to the n, because if there did exist a DFA for a to the n, b to the n, we would uh, uh, be able to describe n too quickly, too small. Great applications of Kolmogorov complexity. Unfortunately, we don't have more time to talk about it. I would talk about this for three, for three years if I could. Applications to computational learning theory, to proof techniques. What can you prove with incompressibility? A lot of things in the average in analysis of app, the average case analysis of algorithms had really meticulous, difficult proofs, and then suddenly somebody comes out with a Kolmogorov complexity thing, and it falls quickly. Like this is such a, a, a speed up in proving lower bounds on algorithms, on average case algorithms, right? Because you improve it if the if the algorithm took less time than this, then you could compress something too quickly, right? This is very very powerful technique, very powerful function. A lot of lot to think about here. People have dedicated their lives and careers just to the study of one function. All right, any questions? All right, go watch the presidential debate. Go watch Avi Wigderson's Turing Award lecture. He's going to give a lecture on Alan Turing. It should be exciting. That's what I'm going to go do. All right.